What is the role of education in social life? How does education create, exacerbate, and reinforce different forms of social inequality? What are some of the problems associated with schooling in contemporary life? How are different problems structured, framed, understood, and maintained through education and schooling? On this episode, we're talking all about education and schooling. So sit back, grab a snack, and let's get to it. This week's material introduces the topic of schools and explains many of the social problems that are related to the school system. Indeed, schools and the education system play pivotal, if not fundamental, roles in what sociologists call the life course. And this is defined as a patterned sequence of individual age-linked experiences over time that are entrenched in social institutions and historical institutions. Being so vitally important to young folks' socialization, which is defined as the process by which people internalize and learn their culture, much of which occurs through schooling and childhood, schooling and the education system operate as mediating factors in the life course of almost all individuals. This means that they condition the life outcomes of almost everyone. Sociologists measure the effects of variables within the education system, most often by conducting longitudinal analyses, which are observational methods in which data is gathered for the same subject over a period of time, often extended over years or decades. For example, a cohort of young children entering school at the age of four may be included in a sample to study the differential effects of education on the life course. They would then be studied longitudinally, say every three to five years, over the long term to test the effects of different variables on their life outcomes. These may include social mobility, educational attainment, labor market engagement and achievement, health outcomes, and so on. The chapter examines the relationship between education and work, illustrating how education impacts career mobility, and the challenges that may impede career success. It also includes the university structure and how this may impact career opportunities and success, and it explores the four theoretical perspectives to explain the transition from school into the workforce. The chapter also discusses the labor market at length and demonstrates the social features that have led to the disproportionate representation of some groups in certain markets over other groups. Social inequalities undoubtedly play out within the school system. Ascribed statuses are defined as the statuses assigned to people or groups because of traits that are beyond their control. On the flip side, achieved statuses are statuses that are the result of not inborn qualities, but are the result of effort and accomplishment. They are the social statuses or positions that are the result of accomplishments such as education or occupational attainment. Sociologists have long documented that while we tend to believe that achieved statuses are most important in the labor market, ascribed statuses often have a very influential effect on educational attainment, job outcomes, and job accomplishment. Sociologists believe that education should be an achieved status rather than an ascribed one, yet continue to empirically demonstrate that it is actually often more influenced by ascribed status much more than merit or achievement. Education, no matter which society you are in, is undoubtedly a process of social mobility. Social mobility is the movement of people within the system of social stratification, and education is often viewed as one of the key drivers of that movement within the system of social stratification. However, sociologists have continued to illustrate that social mobility is indeed mediated by a host of ascribed statuses that may be, at least in some ways, equal to or more influential than achieved status. Such factors related to race, class, gender, or sexuality, for instance. Sociologists continue to document the conflict between ascribed statuses and the idea of meritocracy 
or that one is selected to hold positions of power or authority because of their ability and only their ability. This idea that folks who are in privileged positions have gotten there only because of their skills, accomplishments, and hard work conflicts greatly with sociological work that continues to highlight how ascribed statuses applied to people because of traits beyond their control continue to massively impact the entire labor market. In other words, borrowing off Durkheim, Sociologists and economists have found that the effect of ascribed status on education and vocational attainment are indeed social facts, not theories. In your first read, watch, and respond, please answer the following question. What is the difference between ascribed status and achieved status, and how do they account for social mobility? Please use examples in your answer. Two of the key concepts sociologists use to understand social mobility are intragenerational occupational mobility and intergenerational mobility. Of particular importance is intragenerational occupational mobility, or changes in someone's occupation throughout their lifetime or their life course, and intergenerational mobility, which compares social mobility by comparing parents and their children to measure changes. As you will recall, the concept of intergenerational elasticity is also very important to sociologists. It is a measure of inequality transmitted between generations, and is the degree to which changing one variable actually changes another. A low elasticity, as exists in Denmark by example, means that social class is less persistent and more amenable to change from one generation to the next. The effect of class on educational attainment and social mobility are discussed at length throughout this week's material. The relationship between gender and education is also examined, with attention drawn to how gender influences the labor market, as well as the history of educational achievement across gender identities. The chapter elaborates on the relationship between education and race and discusses the social problems that stem from this relationship. This includes a discussion of indigenous educational achievements as well as those of migrants and racialized folks. The chapter also explores the social consequences that stem from the educational structure, including challenges associated with credentialism and its value in a society. Credentialism is defined as a process of social selection that gives class advantage and social status to people who possess academic advantage. As many of you likely fear, sociologists have documented how there's been an increased credentialism across the labor market, which has resulted in what is called credential inflation. This is the tendency of schools to provide and employers to demand ever more schooling and ever higher credentials for work that has not become more demanding or complex. In some labor markets, this has resulted in massive professionalization which is the process by which an occupation raises its standing by limiting the number of entrants and regulating their behavior. Think of law or medical schools limiting the number of entrants, making it harder to enter that field. In other ways, this has led to the advancement of more small-scale or micro-credentials throughout the labor market. Micro-credentials are mini-qualifications that demonstrate skills, knowledges, and or experience in a given subject area or capability. Sometimes called nano-degrees, micro-credentials tend to be narrower in range than traditional qualifications like diplomas or degrees, and offer employers a very specific set of skills or traits that maybe only a few jobs may require. Now an official policy of Ontario's Ministry of Colleges and Universities, Micro-credentials are being propped up as a solution to a number of social problems in higher education created by the COVID-19 pandemic, as they are viewed as a quick-stop solution to fill rapidly expanding holes in the province's labor market. Critiques of this approach maintain that micro-credentials are very short-sighted. They flatten and simplify learning and a wholesome university education into a supposedly easily measured skill set. In other words, critics maintain that they miss all-encompassing opportunities for deep learning and replace it with a very small skill set. They also hold that this de-skills a labor force en masse, and this will result in the absence of key skills only offered by deeper learning. Critics thus hold that micro-credentials will only further entrench the gig economy, which is a labor market based on flexible, temporary, or freelance jobs, often involving connecting with clients or customers through online platforms, 
and results in heavily precarious and insecure work. And importantly, the rapid increase of micro-credentials remains massively unregulated and thus may provide opportunities for folks to be misled in their educational journey. As noted, some of the biggest issues caused by the rapid inflation of credentials, professionalism, and increase in micro-credentials is that more and more folks are being forced into the secondary or marginal labor market, which is characterized by high turnover, lower paying, and unstable or insecure employment. These jobs offer little chance to get ahead and little job security. The gig economy is riddled with jobs that fit into the secondary labor market. The secondary labor market is differentiated from the primary labor market, which is marked by high paying jobs that provide good chances to quote unquote get ahead and then offer job security and benefits that provide stability for employees such as health and company pensions. With the rise of functional specificity and micro-credentials, more and more folks are suffering from increased precarity and freelancing in their day-to-day -day work, which provides much less security than the primary labor market. In your read, watch, and respond, please answer the following question. What is credential inflation, and how does this impact the primary and secondary labor markets? Please be specific and include examples in your response. There are four theories that help us understand the young adults transition from school into the labor force. Segmented labor market theory argues that the labor market is stratified and entry and upward mobility are limited with only a high school education. Human capital theory is a theory proposing that there is a linear relationship between education and job attainment. More education simply gets better jobs. It suggests that there is a strong relationship between education and job attainment, that the more education you have, the more human capital you accumulate, which then translate into better job outcomes. Signaling theory is a theory that refers to symbolic meanings attached to different attainments on a person's resume. It also refers to the employer's decoding of these signals in assessing the potential worth and trainability of a young employee. In other words, it refers to the ways in which employers decode a person's resume so as to assume their worth to the job market and potential employability. Network theory is about the importance of social networks and social capital in gaining employment, especially the importance of friends and acquaintances who vouch for the quality of potential employees. It suggests that it is a person's social network that helps guide them towards their career goals. Careers take place within markets. As noted, these are called the primary labor market and the secondary or marginal labor market. The primary labor market consists of well-paying jobs with security and upward mobility. Jobs that fall into this category are law, plumbing, electricians, and other skilled trades, manufacturing, nursing, teaching, etc. The secondary labor market includes low-paying jobs with little to no security and limited opportunity for upward mobility. Taxi and Uber drivers, freelancers, contract workers all fit into this category. What plays into this labor market divide is credentialism. The idea that there is a social selection mechanism that gives class advantage to those with academic advantages. Different sociological approaches think about schooling in very different ways. The social constructivist sees schooling as a necessary aspect of socialization which is the internalization and learning of one's culture, rules, norms, values, skills, and so on. They believe that schools, when fair, create an opportunity for meritocracy, which you will recall is the holding of power or authority by people based solely on their skills and abilities. According to the functionalist, it is when schools fail to uphold their manifest functions, which you will remember are the visible and intended goals of social institutions that young people run into problems later in life. Thus, functions such as socialization, assimilation, and the transmission of knowledge are all forms of manifest functions within the schooling system on which schools should be focusing. On the other hand, conflict theorists see the education system as a space of disequilibrium and one that fosters mass inequality. While some groups are privileged and held in favor, inequality on the basis of class, race, and gender all persist in the classroom as fundamental features of the institution itself. 
because they are all institutions created in advanced capitalist societies. Conflict theorists would suggest that contemporary educational institutions are structured by the very forces of capitalism, and because of that they serve the needs of that system. They are meant to, and thus do, promote and sustain class inequality. They serve the advanced capitalist system upon which they are founded. The symbolic interactionist is interested in the micro-interactions that take place between, say, students and teachers, for example. They might look at how so-called good teaching positively influences young people, which may then impact their life course in a variety of important ways. Remember, the symbolic interactionist is always focused on the micro-level interactions between individuals and the meaning derived from those interactions, language, symbols, signs, etc. Feminists are primarily focused on the ways in which schools today deliver a male-centric education that puts women at a systemic disadvantage. As part and parcel of the overarching system of patriarchy, the education system itself is male-centric and offers men with more opportunities and structurally favors their experiences. Feminists, for instance, have documented how women are much more successful in the university, and in particular in professional schools like law school and medical school. And yet despite this, the gender pay gap still exists even within those fields. They have continued to illuminate the ways in which patriarchy conditions both the education system and the labor market marked by advanced capitalism, both undoubtedly lead to structural gender inequality. Intersectional scholars have documented how these same patterns are empirical facts for folks who already face a number of structural barriers to inclusion in the labor market, including racialized folks, indigenous folks, and folks who are discriminated against based on their sexuality or ability status. If you have not done so already, please go back to last week's lecture where we discussed the residential school system at length and provide concrete examples of how our systems of education in Canada are fundamentally structured by forms of racism and discrimination. These are all empirical facts, or again to borrow from Durkheim's idea of social facts. Our labor market is a product of systemic racism, discrimination, and oppression, and has resulted in the structural discrimination of a number of different folks. So that's it for today. I hope you learned something about schools and education and the social problems that are created within them. This has been Professor Selva, and I'll catch you on the next episode of Social Problems. Mm -hmm.